can't hear you. Hi, Christy. Oh, okay. okay. Now I can hear everyone. <laughs> yes. All right. I'm going to finish blow drying my hair really fast. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. High five. Hey, what's up, girl? How you doing? Oh, uh, nothing. I was, I was just writing the, um, this, the questions. Uh-huh. Um, oh, so. Scratchy, scratchy. Okay. All right. Awesome. Wait, I've, I've put them in front of your face. Hold on. Okay. Now, how's it going with you? I can't oh. wait to hear about your stuff, man. Lost my mind. What am I doing? I mean, look at, I mean, this is, this is like the usual for the office. It looks like this all the time, but awesome. I, I've just been busting it out. I really didn't do too much on the website today because mm -hmm. I was uh, dealing with the, uh, with the podcast mm -hmm. the interview with the, the prison warden and What's something the warden say? today. So I'm not like grinding out five stories a day for yeah, a website don't, and doing that do too. No. What did the warden say? What warden do you talk to? The county one? Yeah, Dennis Nelson. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, it's interesting because they don't have any cases at all. They they hadn't really taken anybody in in the past month, so they're clean, mm. and they're trying to keep it that way. So mm -hmm. they're trying to keep the staff clean. Mm -hmm. So we just talked about that, and you know, the prison in general and how it's set up, and the fact that everybody has masks provided by uh, Department of Corrections, and this and that. You know, mm. visits are going to look very different. Okay. All right. I'm gonna get my uh, hairbrush. I I I'm not trying. I'm not I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try a little. I put on a shirt over my pajamas, so um. <laughs> hang on, hang on. Let me find a hairbrush. Hold on. I feel, I feel so as if I had been blessed by a consultant with my little outfit here. Hi, Beverly. What are people in here yet? Uh, there's just. Four people. Okay, one is Sheena. I think. And Wait, one is the word Beverly Rhodes. I just hid non-video participants. Oops, oh. I'm sorry, okay. Beverly. I don't know how to get you oh, back. Let's uh, participants. I don't know. Okay, well, chat land. I'm gonna open my email. I had a. I had like. It took me a minute to understand how to get on here. Mm -hmm. And I don't see anything from Eric, so perhaps he's not sending a frantic last minute email like I did. It says I need the meeting password. Do you know what it is? But I think you're, it's, he's asking for it? Uh, yeah, he's asking. Um, uh, I'm seeing okay. him. What do we need? Eric just sent me an email. He says, what is the password? And I'm going to tell him I was eventually able to get in with just the link. Yeah, he yeah. should be able to just use the link. Um, ah, but I think I, I can try and find a password for him. I'm sending him an email now. Um, I don't know if it was because the meeting hadn't started yet or what. I think that's what it was because when I saw your email and then I, I logged in and I was the only one on. Okay. So it, sh it should be working now because I hadn't started it yet. Okay. Oh, here's Paula. Okay. It's yeah, started. people are coming in. Okay. And I had already registered, but I clicked on the link in the email anyway, and it just asked me to register again. Oh, oh for Zoom? And I walked right in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, Sheena, I'm going to CC you okay. on this that Eric is sending. All right, so we'll get Eric and, um, oh, there's Paula. Hey, Paula. <laughs> Hi, Paula. Oh, Paula, your, your mic's off. Hey, hey good. there you are. Hey. It looks like you're in Command Central. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's kind of fun. I think Grant is going to join us too. Yeah, I sent him the link. He asked for it. So, yeah, hopefully he'll join us. Let me see. I'm not sure where Christy is. Beverly Rhodes is coming. Yep, she's on. She's on. Oh, hold on. This is Christy. Hey. 
<laughs> yeah. This will be a great way to do meetings once we get it like all iron, like all kind yeah. of meetings, like city yeah. hall and everything. I, I am enjoying Zooming. Like I'm going to cover a Gwinnett County meeting right after this. How fabulous. And, and Maggie, as talented as you are, you are typing a story while everybody's talking. Not me. Not me. I'm not doing nothing. I'm just, I'm just sitting here visiting. Uh, is that Sheena's cat? Hey, cat. Hello, cat. <laughs> cat might not be interested in us. Cat is definitely not interested. There she is. Okay. <laughs> Can I make this bigger? Yeah. Yeah, I, she was making me want to brush my hair too. Uh, mine was, I, it's been in a bun for about six weeks now. So I <laughs> like showered and washed it and actually like used product and blow dried it. And now it's, I forgot how much hair I have. That is like the wing on the side. I only have the wings <laughs> that I don't like. It doesn't want to be curly and it doesn't want to be straight. So it's just wings. <laughs> Hello, Beverly Rhodes. I hope you're well. Is she, did you let her in? Yeah, yes, she's, she's in, she's here. just okay. on mute right now. Oh, I see. There she goes. Hello, Beverly. Hi, Paula, how are you? I'm so glad you're on this. Oh, yes, I actually, um, of course, uh, registered and then I got a call for, for another meeting. So, but I wanted, I was gonna record it on one device so I could go back and listen to it. <laughs> Cause I have another call at five o'clock as well. There's Eric. Aha. Uh -huh. Hi, Eric. Hey, Eric. Awesome. I was having some technical difficulties there. <laughs> now you're one minute now. before hey. deadline. Perfect. <laughs> how are you? Good. Good. How are you? Good. We'll give everybody else, we have a few more people who have registered, so we'll give everybody else a few, maybe one or two more minutes to enter the room and then we'll get started. Ooh, do let me turn off my phone. Cool, cool. How's everybody doing on this hump day? <laughs> I don't even know what day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> I know, they're all meshing together, seriously. All I know is it's today. Yeah. It'll always be today, whatever day you're on. <laughs> hey Siri, turn off phone. Mm -hmm. Do you use Siri? Yeah. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Eric is talking to Siri over here, and I'm like, <laughs> what? You're, everything you were saying was coming up on my phone on Siri. <laughs> oh, okay. She just has a mind of her own. <laughs> all right we're we're doing the debates um the first round of debates will be not on zoom but on a uh online platform of some sort like this i think it'll be webex webex mm -hmm. um this this should be a fun learning year for us yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I wish I'd had this when I was teaching. Teaching online classes, this would be great. You know, you I, I was on one Monday night oh, okay. and they dropped us into groups, which was awfully fun. Really? Uh, you know, teams. And then you could work with the team and then you could go back with the instructor. It was wonderful. Oh, that's great. Was that a Zoom also? It was a Zoom. Yeah. You can do that. Mm -hmm. I, did, I didn't realize it until he's a professor at Georgia Tech and I'm taking one of his classes. And um, he said, I'm going to put you into groups. And I'm thinking, hmm, I didn't know you could do that. Mm -hmm. Hi, Merit. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> 
So I think we have a couple more joining, but um, since it's after five, we will go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody. Um, most of you know me, I'm Christy Wooten. I'm the new president of the Atlanta Press Club. And today's Zoom is the challenges of covering COVID-19 in your community, switching the focus of your beat. And we'll make some introductions in just a second, but I'll go ahead and tell everybody a little bit about the Atlanta Press Club. We are one of the largest and most active press clubs in the country. And we have uh, previously had a lot of in-person events that we do, but now we're having Zoom events for the time being. Um, and this, this series that we're in right now is focused on journalists and helping journalists, just basically giving, trying to start a little community for journalists to talk about the challenges of what we're all going through in the pandemic right now and, and how that works out with reporting and, and sources and everything like that. So. Uh, for tonight's edition, we've got Maggie Lee leading the discussion. Maggie will wave at us. <laughs> and then joining her are Eric Jackson. Yeah, and Robin. Hey. Hey, y'all. And I'll tell you a little bit about them. Um, Maggie's a freelance reporter. She covers state and metro government in Atlanta. Um, she's written for McClatchy's, Georgia Papers. Creative Loafing, Supporter Report, and others. And she's popular on Twitter, if you want to follow her. Um, <laughs> she's going to lead us into the discussion today about journalists, how we're all coping under the pressure of a worldwide pa pandemic. I can't talk, sorry. And how we're all trying to equitably report on the impacts in local communities. And Eric, as you know, you may know, he's the sports business reporter for the Atlanta Business Chronicle. And Robin Kemp uh, reports on news in Clayton County and has also just started a nonprofit that she's going to tell us about um, during the session today. So this is a very casual dis discussion where this is this event would normally be happening in a brew pub with journalists. So it's not super formal and we'll have questions and answers and feel free to jump in after everybody says their part. Um, we are expecting a few more, but we'll go ahead and get started and um, Maggie, you're up. So, um, so thanks everybody for, for joining us this evening. Uh, like Christy said, this is informal. I think I, I, I pretty much know everybody in here and they're, please chime in. I, there's a raise hand button. Maybe you can raise hand that, that may cause something to happen. Um, it, but, um, so I wanted to talk about, um, first with us, uh, this evening we have, um, Eric Jackson, who is, who is, Christy said, is a sports business reporter at uh, the Atlanta Business Chronicle. I looked up his last two bylines. One of them is about Arthur Blank writing a book, which that seems like something that might always be part of the to-do list. And another one about the whole Harlem Globetrotters. And I'm not sure if that's always on his day-to-day -day reporting list. And then the other guest is Robin Kemp, who I always think of as like the person who knows everything about what's going on in Clayton County. Um, and now um, she also knows something about what it's like when, when um, your number comes up at a newspaper that's losing advertisements. And so you end up starting your own nonprofit in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so first, you know, Robin and Eric are, are either, neither one of y'all are, are assigned directly to report on the pandemic as as news exactly right you're you're blending it into the, your regular beats i don't know how's COVID coming in for you eric yeah i mean i know for me specifically it's it's um you know f from different sports reporters right they kind of cover the day-to-day -day, so i know they're kind of at a loss for content but in some ways i feel like i'm uh, honestly working more you know it's just from the you got to think like the financial impact and the implications of all these losses and not having games and such. So in a lot of ways, it's almost, you know, more on the plate in, in, in some ways. Now, of course, the ideas have to be a little bit more creative, right? They weren't, uh, they were a little bit more obvious, right? When the sports were, were flowing, but um, yeah, I mean, honestly, in a lot of ways, it's exciting in a, in a morbid kind of way. Um, but, you know, these are historic times. So I try to, you know, uh, you know, try to continue to write, I think the challenges still continue to write impactful news, you know, uh, even when, you know, even, even when there's no sports going on. I mean, what do you find are like the big so, yeah. themes in the sports business right now? Is it just like 
no revenue. That's it. We, 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 disaster. Is it like complete disaster in the sports business or, or you know, what are the themes you're finding? Right, right. I mean, that's, that's really, yeah. I mean, most of the mm-hmm. stories are, you know, the financial losses and the, mm-hmm. you know, projections of what these teams, these professional teams, not just the professionals, but, you know, the college uh, athletic departments as well, and what their losses. So oh. uh, a lot of the stories have been kind of doomy and gloomy, but uh, we're, mm-hmm. we're trying to move forward and trying to get more solution based coverage as well. Right. What are the, what are these organizations doing to kind of, um, you know, offset and, you know, move forward and try to, uh, you know, plug in some of these holes in the budget. So, um, you know, the first few weeks were a lot of those, you know, what's closed, what's still open, you know, what events are still going mm-hmm. on. So it's, mm-hmm. it's, not, it's sort of that balance of, you know, uh, some of those quick hitters of, you know, the furloughs, like you mentioned, the Globetrotter story, you know, uh, what staffs are still together. Mm-hmm. And then the other ones are like, you know, how are, how are these people moving forward and trying to, you know, continue, you know, regardless. Um, what the, what are some of the solutions that the sports industry is coming up with? I mean, I, I, I apologize if these are dumb questions. Like I have no, I, I can't no, imagine no, no, no. what's going on in sports business. What are, you mentioned solutions based journalism. So what are some of the solutions that are starting to appear? Right, right. Well, unfortunately, a lot of those cost measures include layoffs and, and furloughs, but um, yeah. you know, for some of the businesses, they're keeping tight. Some of them are actually, uh, you know, keeping some of their staffs together and, you know, mm-hmm. while that could backfire, they're they're trying to keep things intact. And mm-hmm. uh, you know, some some of these cost saving measures may include you know cutting uh, salaries from some of the higher paid uh, you know employees in the organization. You know, so I mean, nobody wants to make these losses, right? But there a lot of people are doing what they can. Uh, you know, keep the teams intact. You know, um, you know, I know the Braves right now are going to keep paying through May. Um, you know. They're one of the one of the teams that are still, uh, you know, still still paying employees, and you know, mm-hmm. the Falcons are fine for now. And mm-hmm. but you know, some of the other teams, I mean, the MLS has asked players to cut their salaries. I mean, it it really depends depending on the organization. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, everybody's looking for any way to you know be able to keep keep their teams intact. Right, right. And um, like as a reporter, has this changed like? your work day or your report, your like approach to writing or, or things like that, the, the nuts and bolts mechanics of your working day. Right. Right. No, for sure. I mean, being at home, right. I think mm-hmm. it's important to get out a little bit. I think everybody can mm-hmm. uh, attest to that, you know, just to keep, try to keep the creative juices flowing. I think sometimes when you get mm-hmm. stuck in a room, it can, you know, it could get, it could be a little difficult. So I think more so just, you know, uh, you know, while the workplace has been kind of stale, I just, you know, I, I try to find different places around to work. And mm-hmm. so from that aspect, I mean, the, the, you know, it's not like the hours have necessarily changed, but mm-hmm. uh, just where, where the work's being done. Right. So, you know, a lot of phone interviews, which is mm-hmm. tough for me because I'm used to being out and talking to people. And, yeah. you know, so I've definitely had to adjust to that part. Yeah. Are, like a lot of, a lot of the people you would normally talk to, you know, are they easy to get on or, are they holding Zooms or anything or, or right, online right. forums no, for sure. and stuff or it's just you and well, your Rolodex? Well, you can imagine some people are, you know, hesitant to talk about their own losses, right? So, oh, I mean, right. some, people are, some, pe- some people have been, uh, you know, a little tougher to get in touch to than others. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, I, the first couple of weeks, honestly, were just pretty surreal. I mean, I had a, one of our uh, colleagues, one of our photographers, I think it was like early in March and he was like, he's like, what if the final four gets canceled? And I, I like laughed. I literally laughed at him. I'm like, what are you talking about? That would never happen. Like, you know, for all the reasons I, you know, I list and mm-hmm. like, sure enough that happened. So, you know, it's, it, um, it was all pretty surreal the first couple of weeks with March Madness closing and mm-hmm. I mean, it was canceling and, you know, all the ramifications because of that. So mm-hmm. um, really just making that transition I think about all the stories that I was planning to write before all of this happened and they looked mm-hmm. so, uh, you know, they, uh, they're, they're so unimportant, right? For sure. I, yes. I look back and I'm yes. like, you know, it's like, it, it, it kind of makes you laugh, but um, yeah, it's, it's a definitely an interesting time where everybody in the newsroom is writing about the same thing. Right. I don't think that mm-hmm. never usually happens, but mm-hmm. I mean, every topic, every beat is about, you know, the same subject. So. Right. Um, I, I wanted to ask Robin some questions too. I'm gonna, um, y'all are gonna see me scrolling down a little bit. Definitely interesting. Uh, 
Um, so Robin, tell me about how your work has been affected by the pandemic. Well, you know, it's first work has been affected by the pandemic, which is the, the big problem for me personally and for my colleagues who got laid off. Uh, I was at the Clayton News and also the Henry Herald working for the past two years, covering primarily crime and safety and, you know, local politics, things like that. And doing a whole lot of hard news out of Clayton County that was getting picked up by the local TV stations. And, you know, it's, it, it was a little mini, not empire, I don't want to say empire, but it, it was, it was a really good healthy beat that was feeding a lot of other people too. And all of a sudden the rug got pulled out from under that. And the problem is this, when I moved to Clayton County about 13 years ago, it wasn't because I wanted to live there particularly, it's because I could afford to live there. So we bought a house over here and I eventually decided let me try and work at the paper because it looked like they need the help that's how i got there now the paper is in very very dire straits we've lost more than half of our advertising uh forget about classifieds they're the paper of record and they're not getting any foreclosures which was apparently the bulk of it and so there's nothing and of course business has pulled right. the rug from under everybody there's no advertising so right right you know i i gotta do what i gotta do and over this period of time, I've gotten kind of entrenched and I know people and I can find my way around and I know who's a good source and who isn't. And it's a very important part of the Metro that frankly isn't covered very well. And it's not that people like Leon Stafford don't do a good job of covering it. It's just that there are not a lot of people resources put into Clayton County news wise. So I've always said that if something happened, that I would try and start a nonprofit news site for Clayton County. Well, it happened. And I, I literally got the phone call in bed when I woke up that morning, got up and came in here and made it. I just put the site up and started putting stories in it and said, oh, maybe I'll do a podcast. I started doing that. And uh, started soliciting GoFundMe donations and all of this before I even set up the nonprofit part of it. So I'm taking like five big steps back and dealing with the Institute for Nonprofit News and dealing also with the, your original question, I'm sorry, the COVID story, which is really, really of high interest down here because it's a primarily African American population and a lot of people who are in frontline jobs and a lot of people who are getting sick down here. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's uh, the same in Atlanta. I mean, it's uh, yeah. very much, well, and in Georgia and across the country, disproportionately infecting African-Americans. Yeah. So my charge, I guess, is to keep up with that. I've managed to get very, very hyper-local and get some city-by-city numbers that apparently don't seem to be going out to everyone. Um, mm -hmm. If anybody would like those numbers, I'd be happy to tell you how to get them. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been getting them, I was getting them directly from the Clayton County Board of Health by asking nicely mm -hmm. of Dr. Obusanjo, but of course he's super busy. And we talked and he suggested maybe getting them from uh, Valerie at Clayton County. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. I talked to her and she talked to Laura Richardson, Chief Richardson, who's dealing with Chief Markison in the EMA. And we all sorted out that Valerie would send me these numbers daily, more or less when they get them, they send them and it's usually mm -hmm. like seven in the evening, and, you know, but I, when I get them, I put them out. Yeah, so yeah. I'm sure Val would add anybody to that number who wanted Clayton County specific numbers. I don't know that anybody else wants them but me, but they're out there if you want them. Well, it's interesting you bring up, you know, your connections, of course, can get you those hyper local numbers, can get you a lot better numbers than are on the state side, state website. I, I mean, I ran into the same thing myself with on a, on a Hall County story this week. The Hall County Hospital, you just call them up. They'll give you much more detailed information than the state publishes. And you know, when you have these small papers shut down and you lose people, you know, like the Robin Kemp's of the world, I mean, just so much information never gets out to the public that should get out to the public. 
here's the important thing about getting those particular numbers for wherever you are though mm -hmm. they come from the state the state gives them to the county and the county passes them on to the local mayors and the ema and me and just because mm -hmm. i asked you know mm -hmm. so it may be you can just go and ask whoever your local health department people are mm -hmm. and in a place like Hall county they may or may not be super busy i don't know so, oh yeah, I don't know. The hospital is like, they're like, yeah, here's all the results by like race and Latino status and everything of everybody we've tested. Here you go. Wow. Yeah. I mean, they're, wow. they're very, oh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just call it. So sorry, Hall County Hospital, but now all the reporters are going to call y'all, but, but they publish them too. So, um, they, they published like Monday and anyway, they're super friendly. Um, but okay, so I, I wanted to ask you a little bit more though about the nonprofit. Let's let's at least say the name of it, Clayton Crescent. Y'all Google it. Crescent.com. It probably should be .org, but it says ClaytonCrescent.com. What's it um, going to be? Is it going to be the kind of hard news you've been um, you've been doing, or what? Yes and no. It's it's going to be less of the kind of ambulance chasing. It's not going to be so much you know every single arrest, every single shooting. It's not going to be that. It's going to be uh, a little bit more topical, but it's also going to keep covering things like city councils around. There, there are seven municipalities, and right, right. it's impossible for one person to cover everything in two counties for sure. It's pretty tough for one person to cover everything in Clayton County. So what I'm hoping to do, please go, please, I have no idea what I'm doing. This is the truth. Uh, once I get the nonprofit piece of it set up, which I'm working on, Mm -hmm. uh, the the goal is to be able to hire a couple of other people i think the minimum to do it right would be three yeah. and i would like to have four mm -hmm. where the money's gonna come from your guess is as good as mine yeah. so, i'm in the part where you have to was get that the, always your it, plan Robin? i'm sorry oh Second. he said was that always your plan I was, saying, was was that always your plan if you were if, if your job was affected, was that always your plan to launch yes, a, yes, a new site? Yes, yes, yes. And I had talked about it with some folks at the paper too and said, oh, if this ever happens, we should do thus and so. And everybody said, yeah, sure. And I said, no, I'm serious. Because if you look at things like The Lens or uh, Texas Tribune, they're viable. They've been, they've been going for several years. They figured out a way to do it. Why can't we? Right. There's so much happening down here. It really is. I think it's very necessary. You're talking about roughly 300,000 people just in Clayton County alone. So Clayton County and the South side, that's a lot of people. I have a question I wanted to ask both of you, both Eric and Robin. What are some topics about the impact of COVID-19 that aren't being covered? I mean, everybody's so busy. Stuff is, there's, there's stuff on your to-do list that's not getting done. What, what do y'all, what do y'all think? What are some things we're missing? Well, I think, I think you guys started to kind of hit on the head a little bit. I mean, the how minority uh, communities are being affected most. You know, I think there's been a couple stories, and in, including ours, but I think, uh, I think we could still do a better job of, you know, telling those stories. Um, you know, how disproportionately, you know, it's been impacted in those areas, so. I mean, that definitely comes to the top of the list for me when I think about it. And I mean, we always brainstorm. We have, you know, we have our staff meetings every morning as well. And we kind of think about some, you know, kind of brainstorm some ideas. Uh, there's definitely companies that are doing well, right, that are thriving, you know, whether it's construction or the playground recreation needs or, you know, others that, you know, are benefiting from this. So I think those are also interesting, you know, the people who are actually, you know, winning from this. Mm, I like that. That's a neat idea. So, Who's winning from pandemic? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of real estate people. Well, I know Zoom. Pandemic. Zoom pretty good. I wish I would have bought shares. <laughs> <laughs> I think some real estate people may win from pandemic. I It occurred to me this morning that uh, small businesses that are not able to make it through for whatever reason they may be running storefronts or they may actually own property themselves and have to sell it. It would be interesting to see who is buying that up, but that's, I think, a little longer term story. Mm. Um, in the near term, one thing that 
I've been watching and would like to do more on, haven't had a chance to yet, uh, is how the different communities within my coverage area are responding. There are three major language communities that would be English, Spanish, and Vietnamese down here. And everybody has a little different take on it. Um, at first, the city of Forest Park uh, was putting out uh, an emergency order from the mayor that the English version said, oh, everybody go inside and, and be careful and keep six feet apart and do all the things and wash your hands. And I don't know who wrote it. The Spanish version said, you must go inside or else you're going to have to pay up to a thousand dollar fine and possible jail time. And I called up City Hall and I said, what is this? Why is the tone so different between these two? And they said, oh, it was just a draft. We're fixing it right now. Oh and they God. hurried up and, and they made them all nice and friendly. I put a Vietnamese one that was the same as well and distributed that. But it was, it highlights the fact that, you know, there's an assumption or a presumption that, you know, people who don't, who speak Spanish in particular around here need to be told what to do, mm. right? And that's not necessarily the case, not in that way. So I think I think that's a good point with people who don't speak English as you know, what is the impact on people who don't speak English as a first language or, um, you know, there's there's and there's been more reporting on this, like in the L.A. Times and in the New York Times, where they have much larger immigrant communities. But like how um, some people who um, like either they're undocumented or maybe somebody in their household is undocumented. So they're maybe afraid to go to the hospital or, oh, if the food drive is sponsored by the state national guard, they're not trying to go near anybody in a uniform because, you know, who knows, who knows what that guy is up to. And it's so, you know, it's, it's another, it's going to be another disproportionate impact thing. What, you know, how is this going to hurt? immigrant community the numbers and, and see that it is already mm -hmm. um, which is really disturbing mm -hmm. one of the problems with um and i'm speaking in very large general terms mm -hmm. but one of the problems with a lot of the spanish-speaking immigrant community is that many of them speak some spanish but they mm -hmm. mostly speak a native language and oh, spanish right right and no english or they might have a few words of english mm -hmm. i used to be gsl down here so that's how i know this mm -hmm. um so you're also dealing with people who have fourth, fifth, sixth grade education, because that's basically sixth grade is when it stops in Mexico in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have folks who have really basic, limited education about life period. Right. And so they may not understand why it's important to wear a mask or do other things that seem very abstract, unless you have had a certain level of education. And you don't have to go to college, you just have to hear the, the message and the explanation in a way that you can understand it enough times. Right, right. And I don't know that that is necessarily happening. Um, and I wanted to, uh, for the people who are in here, I, I think if y'all like want to raise any, if y'all have a point or want to ask a question, there's a raise hand button. And I think maybe Sheena sees what occurs yeah, if you press raise the, hand. I don't see the button, but I oh, do. Oh, okay. Have I do just want to point out. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. For those that don't know, I'm Native American, and one of the hot spots in this country is the Navajo Nation. Yes. Um, and I, we just we know that stuff like this is going to categorically um, affect people of color more. But I just I haven't even thought about the language barrier. The Navajo Nation is one of the few reservations that still. Um, for the most part, pretty much speaks their native language in addition to Spanish and English. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know, just something to throw out if you wanted to look, if anyone wanted to look and see how the Navajo Times is covering it. Um, it's oh, been yeah. really interesting. And Indian country today as well. That's the yeah. national yeah. Native American. That's all. Cool. Yeah, that's interesting. I got to check that out. Um, yeah, I don't know if somebody if you click on like participants or something, there's a button that says raise hand, or maybe you can unmute yourself or if you if you if anybody wants to say anything or ask a question. Um, but unless or until that occurs, I, I have I have more more questions that I'll, I'll happily continue with. Um, 
a, a question again for, for both of you, Robin and Eric, is I admit I have been slacking off on filing open record requests that are not related to COVID because I'm like, these people are busy with things that are not, that, that are COVID. What should, should we be filing open record requests right now that are not related to COVID? Oh yeah. Yeah. Make a <laughs> one for it. I look, I just got one today. I just got one today. <laughs> it's not going to change the world, but, um, and the first week I was like, Oh, I don't want to bother anybody. And everybody's so busy. And after that I was like, no, no, you know, you guys are set up, you're doing your business from home. You know, don't give me that garbage. It's an electronic record. I'm just going to ask for it. It's an email forwarded. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, all of them I've asked for have been COVID related just because that's kind of just, you know, you know, obviously the, the, the main focus of coverage right now. Um, yeah, I can't really think of, honestly, between, between all the writers, really. I mean, there's been a, a few stories that haven't been, you know, as far as, uh, especially real estate, as far as some new developments or, you know, some new deals that have gone on. But outside of that, it's been, it's been pretty COVID heavy, you know. It's I'd, over at Atlanta City Hall, like Atlanta City Hall pretty early on started doing their meetings online and it seems to have like gone pretty well for them, like their committees and full council. So they're still doing some business that has nothing to do with COVID. Like my most popular story has been about them acquiring a bunch of parkland. And I mean, that was way in the works before COVID. And I guess it, you know, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. It didn't need an ORR, but it, Atlanta city council anyway, some business is, is going on. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the economic development drum is still beating loud, maybe louder in Clayton. Um, Moro, the city of Moro, and I haven't quite sussed all this out yet, but the, the city of Moro seems to be having some financial trouble. And I think it has to do with the, it, it, it seems to be related to the property tax and or just, you know, having enough sales tax income coming in. Mm -hmm. Um, that was before all this happened. So now they're really all about reopening. They want the businesses to open, mm -hmm. but they don't want to come right out and say they want the businesses to open. So they're, they're saying things like, well, you know, we'll do anything. We'll do anything to help our small businesses. Um, the, uh, Aerotropolis Atlanta is doing the model mile green belt presentations over zoom in the next week or so for the different mm. municipalities mm -hmm. um what else is there going on um jonesboro is is talking about uh its main street renovations of the old firehouse which is going to be a brew pub kind of thing and, and mm -hmm. for but that. things are still going on yeah things are still going yeah. on and yeah. so i try to add that in the mix but i i just find that the, the only story on anybody's mind is COVID-19 and people want to know how many African Americans were affected in my city, my county. Mm -hmm. uh, people are debating whether or not they're going to go get their hair cut. And I think those kinds of stories are just like so easy to do. It's so easy to get people on the phone and say, or online and say, Hey, you know, are you reopening your barbershop or not? Mm -hmm. I'll I, I wanted to ask Eric about the business side, actually, because, of course, on the politics side, what we're seeing is the tension, you know, politicians on the one hand, they're hearing people who say, let's stay home for safety, but they're also getting pressure from businesses that want to reopen. What's, you know, what's, what's the mood among sports businesses? I mean, you know, your, your, your teams you know, right, right. around there, are they like panicking to reopen or are they panicking to stay closed? Well, I mean, as far as the teams go, I mean, mm. you know, they want to get the players back on the field as much mm -hmm. as, as quick as possible. I mean, and the big incentive is that, as you can imagine, is money, right? Um, right. That's the big incentive for them to want to get them back out. And the thing is, we'll probably see games, you know, um, come back. But the thing is, will they have fans or not? That's kind of the big question, right? It's, mm -hmm. are we in a place to, you know, fill stadiums back up with people? I just don't think we're there yet, but... I think we will see, you know, at least with football season, for example, you know, I think we'll see a season, but um, if there'll be a crowd or not, that's the question. But yeah, I mean, as far as um, some of the organizations go, I mean, um, 
like, for example, the Braves, you know, the batteries, a big part of their, uh, you know, it's a big chunk of their revenue. Right. And when all of that's grinded to a halt, you know, the restaurants and, you know, everything else that's there, the bars, you know, that's, that definitely has an impact. And that's been, you know, the, the foot traffic's been dead around there right now. So, you know, on top of not having the players playing, you know, the games going, you know, you know, nothing's flowing over there either, you know, because they bank on that, especially this time. You know, typically that that area would be, you know, jumping right now, you know what I mean, with, with, uh, with the season, you know, being underway. So that's definitely dried up right now. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously with Kim's order, I'm actually – I was in the process of the day seeing what bowling alleys are actually going to go back open and um, – you know, so we'll, we'll we'll see. We'll see if they actually. I think a couple are actually gonna open, but how many people are actually gonna come? That's the question. So, um, so yeah, for sure. What um, what when when are some? Okay, this is I'm I'm really sports stupid, so you're gonna have to help me with this. What are <laughs> no, like what fine. are some? It's no, hard. it's true. It's true. Like what are when might we know some of the answers to these questions by when will we know uh, you know whether or not we'll have fans at the stadiums are there like some deadlines coming up are there some things like you got to report on in the next week or two weeks or so well right well it, it depends so mm -hmm. like you know for like some of the tennis tournaments and other places mm -hmm. like that like Wimbledon example they had to cancel because, you know, you have a window for insurance policies, right? So some people have certain other things that kind of force their timetable. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's the same here. Uh, I mean, the, you know, the, the sports league commissioners and everybody else is in charge. You know, they, they really can't make the decision. I mean, it's the public health officials that have to really make that decision. Mm -hmm. And as far as same with, uh, you know, same with pro and college, you know, that decision lies with, um, you know, government leaders, you know, government camp, and he's going to be in touch, for example, with college football. Mm -hmm. He'll be in touch with, you know, um, you know, the system of Georgia, you know, the board of regents, and they kind of make that decision together. You know, it goes above even the president, you know, the president of the university's head, you know, or the athletic director, right? As much power as they have, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's way above their head too, you know? So um, those decisions are made at the, you know, the federal state level. Right, right. Um, what a, a question again for both of y'all. Um, what are you finding are some useful reporting resources right now? Like, are there new sources you're going to? Are there um, are there new sites you might be reading that you didn't read a month or two ago? What's 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 coming in handy right now? What are you using? Those numbers from from DPH are very handy. Uh, I, I was honestly surprised that I got them. I didn't have to do anything but ask nicely and I got them. Mm -hmm. um, I love that and I don't see anybody else offering it and I, I just want to urge everybody else to try it in your jurisdiction. Um, that's the most important thing right now. I've been looking for some things. I, Big Local News has a national map with numbers on it, but the problem is they're yesterday's numbers. They update every evening. I think they said around seven. Mm -hmm. So they, they update once a day. Yeah. So we're getting updates twice a day, plus, you know, trining in whatever these other numbers are for the cities, if you want to do that. Um, honestly, I just, I check out what Clayton County puts up on its webpage. The EMA has just, but all of its daily dashboard, which is straight from the state uh, Georgia Emergency Management Association dashboard into the county website. And if I need to look at something, I can look at it, but it's not really anything I don't have already. It's the numbers that come out and maybe the daily situation report in a very digested flyer version. Um, what I would really like is just some more direct communication. You know, I, I, I'm, I want to respect that they have things to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to go through the PR folks in a way that I wouldn't normally do under the circumstances. But sometimes I just have a question. I just need to get it answered. You know, that's that your mileage may vary depending on who and where that is. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, Department of Labor site. I mean, that's yeah. that's somewhere I've I was never really looking at before this, and now it's something you know I'm checking almost every day. You know, for the Warren reports and others, and mm-hmm. you know that overall I've been just digging into documents more. I mean, just rolling up my sleeves, and you know, right now I'm working on a story on you know how the decrease in hotel motel taxes you know affect you know stadiums and other projects, Ooh. and you know, so I've had to really uh, you know educate myself right and really dig through these files and um, so yeah I mean that part even financial statements you know between with the colleges and athletic departments and you know just expenditures and you know just seeing what these budget holes will potentially look like and it's it's uh so yeah I mean I think more than ever I've had to really look at the, the the you know the fine print as they say. Now y'all y'all know I'm going to answer this with with some news nerdery thing but what i have gotten a lot of mileage out of is um is this nonprofit that's called the internet archive oh, and their, yeah. yeah yeah their website is called um uh, it's it's just internet it's archive.org but there's a portion of it called the wayback machine, wayback machine. Yeah. and you can submit a url to that wayback machine and it takes a snapshot of it at that moment in time. And that's spectacular because that State Department of Public Health website of how many whatever infections there are, that changes every single day. And so you haven't, you haven't been able to see like the data from a week ago or two weeks ago, except that people have been putting it in the Wayback Machine. Yeah. And it's the same thing for the Department of Labor page, like that Department of Labor page of announcements changes every day and they don't keep the archived ones but they are archived on archive.org wayback machine um so it, it's it, it's yeah. called archive.org yeah yeah it's archive.org and there's a lot of things on archive.org but one of them is the wayback machine and you'll see it it's like right at the top and you can it it's it's not the most user friendly site but you can fiddle around with it and you'll be able to see all of those snapshots like it'll bring up a calendar of like here's the state department of labor page on april 21 at 4 p.m or whatever That's cool. gotcha. hey maggie do you know if they do you know if um the way back for the covid report has kind of gotten consistent again the last couple of times i've checked just to cross check numbers i've noticed it wasn't there yeah, the Wayback Machine, like, people have to go to that and submit a website. Like, the, the Wayback Machine doesn't automatically necessarily crawl the internet. So it depends on people going to it from time to time and submitting that URL. Like, I have a bot that's doing it. Some other people have some bots that's doing it. But, you know, if they change their URL, it, it can be spotty. It's not foolproof, definitely. It's not foolproof. But it's it's one way to look at, you know, it is what it is. It's, it's uh, some may be missing. All right, mm. it, anything else? From yeah, that's, yeah, that's really interesting for sure. I'm gonna have to check that out. I, that right. page, every time that page saves my butt, I donate $5 to the internet archive and it's a couple of times a year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for everybody. Okay. So. Anybody who's here, um, not only the panelists, but everyone, if you're a reporter, editor, whatever you're working on, what has been your biggest challenge as far as the reporting aspect of COVID? And I know, Robin, your biggest challenge was, you know, (laughs) being laid off. But, um, you know, as far as actual reporting goes, and I know you guys talked about sources and, and resources, too, but if anybody can relay any kind of personal experience where you ran into a wall or you had a breakthrough. Yeah, actually, yes. Um, and I don't have ready access to court documents down here. You have to go in physically and look them up on the machine. You can't get them from, you know, the web the way you can in most other counties in the state of Georgia. Um, that's obviously not happening now. So if I need to look up a court case, I really can't do it. I mean, I suppose I can call the clerk's office and ask them to pull it for me and they probably don't have anything else to do. So they probably do it. But the inability to access those basic documents online while 
the court system is discovering fire and saying, oh, look, we can do all these things and we can have people submit things online. Yeah, well, it goes in, but it doesn't come out. Um, I'd like to see that change. I mean, so much of what I do is go to meetings anyway, like go to public meetings. And now all those public meetings are online. So, you know, one thing, um, like Brian Kemp has been having press conferences, like he never has press conferences, not never, he rarely has press conferences. He's having them maybe about once a week now. Um, you know, that's good. I, I don't wanna go, I haven't gone, um, maybe I should, but I haven't, I'm not ready for that just yet. <laughs> And, and Maggie, what's going to be behind your decision? I'm, I'm in the same boat as you, Maggie. I haven't gone yet. What's going to be your, what's going to be your thinking about when you're going to go? I, I think I want to go to that next one just to ask him, are you going to go get a haircut? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, y'all laugh, but like, seriously, what? You no, know. it's really, it's really a good question. It's really a good question, though. Yeah, it's, you know, I don't, I can tie a bandana around my face and go downtown, I guess. But it's, you know, I, the, you know, my, my, um, Maria Supporta did a story about Grady Hospital, and, you know, one of the things she put in the story was, um as she had talked to the chair of the uh, Grady Foundation. Cause it's somebody, it's somebody, you know, a big Grady supporter. And anyway, one of the things she had asked are like, what can we do to help Grady right now? And the answer was, you know, help people who are on the front lines, you know, babysit their kids, bring them their groceries, uh, wash your hands and stay at home. I'm trying to help Grady by staying at home. I don't know. Hmm. Mm. I don't know. What do you? Yeah, no, that's definitely the struggle, right? When you're used to being in person and not being able to do that anymore, no mm -hmm. doubt. I mean, everybody has contacts, right? But still, it's like missing some of those encounter, you know, interactions. That's tough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as much as I love city council by Zoom, yeah, you don't get the serendipity that occurs right. when you actually Sometimes go to city council. You don't get the meeting either. I mean, I've I've struggled with some of these guys you know they all have a learning curve that varies and you know they learn how to turn the mics on and off or whatever but you know forest park in particular is really having trouble with it they'll have somebody dial in you can't hear what they're saying at all they'll take a vote you don't know what the vote was you know it, it's it's ridiculous and i'm afraid that when this is over that there is the possibility that of of seeding some ground and and seeding some access if uh, a municipality decides that oh well let's just do it all the time this way mm. let's just do it this way um it's it's i don't know i don't know if if once everything is over they'll go back to having regular meetings in person i assume they will but it's also possible that they may decide this is the wave of the future and people can't the, the there's no public comment there's, what? Well, you know, they'll, they'll make a space for it. You, oh, yeah. You, yeah, can, yeah. you can go to this other application that you have mm -hmm. to download or go to before 12 noon today, a day in advance, and mm -hmm. submit your question, and we'll answer as many of those questions as we can. You know, it's just, it's it feels uh, barrier to, to people having access to their mm -hmm. elected officials. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what? I, I, I don't know, to get philosophical a little bit or a little bit meta and, and Eric, <laughs> touched on the, Eric touched on this a little bit when he, when he said, um, you know, so looking back at some of his stories he was working on before this, they seem a little bit um, less important now. Hmm. Has reporting on this pandemic kind of changed how you look at your role as a reporter or what you want to achieve as a reporter you know has this got you has, has, has this got y'all introspective any of y'all any, any eric or robin or any of the reporters on here or anybody on here i'll talk about that yeah. because i've been introspective 
I mean, it's real. I'm usually, you know, I'm not a full-time reporter, but I'm a writer. I've written about music for so many years. So I'm always thinking about things kind of introspectively anyway, um, and just trying to glean from the pandemic and, you know, how this is changing us as a people and also watching, you know, as far as what we consume, our media diets, the, it's becoming, it, it has been becoming less print and more video. And now it's not even memes. It's kind of like these just little bites of, and that seems to be all that matters at the end of the day when you're done with work and you open up Twitter and you look for news headlines. I mean, your brain is so used to just taking things down like that. We're not, there's no nuance left in anything. And I think the pandemic has kind of just washed all the rest of the, what shred of nuance was there. It, it's gone now. So I'm really concerned about arts reporting and things that aren't considered, you know how we all right now are in the, oh, that's the necessary job, those are the essential workers. You know, it makes you think about what is going to be essential for journalism in the future. Is it going to be still just like crime, politics, health, and that's it? Are we gonna have, are, are, is arts reporting gonna completely die now? I mean, it's it's been getting smaller and smaller, smaller sliver of publications. So it makes me kind of philosophical about, you know, what, the microcosm of journalism will be after this like and where each little boot fits in i don't know yeah no i totally agree with that for sure i mean even on my beat sports right i mean you know people you know sports you know it's uh people have nicknamed it before you know newsrooms like the toy department right just because obviously it might not have the same <laughs> against us you know some of the other beats but so it was kind of tough for me you know the first couple of weeks um you know feeling of worth right of you know when there's no sports right it's like what uh what role do I have here and what, what the team and other things you know so kind of have to readjust and you know be introspective and still you know and that's what I was mentioning before still trying to write impactful news especially as it pertains and to the business community you know so um and that's a daily challenge you know still trying to um you know you know you know bring that sort of um you know you know sort of worth I guess to you know to our readers you know from my beat so it's a challenge that I, I look forward to, though. It's 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 fun, you know. I mean, seeing what what breaks through and what doesn't, right? It's it's a it's a constant, um, you know, grind. So, so I totally agree for sure with with what Robin said. I, I you know, with arts and other beats, it's going to be tough to see what comes out of this, um, you know, moving forward. Yeah, um, I can speak to this actually. Um, if you guys don't know me, my name is Meredith. I'm the digital editor at Atlanta Magazine. Um, we're a monthly, so this has been <laughs> kind of insane for us trying to figure out um, our June issue is going to the printer next week. So it's like, what is going to be relevant in a month, um, trying to make those stories work. Um, but I think for me, um, as an editor, I cover literally every, every single topic in the city, but as a writer, I primarily cover culture and entertainment. Um, so it's like the things I normally write about, I can't really write about right now, but what's kind of been driving me for the last couple of weeks has just been like the idea of service. Um, we are known as being a service outlet. And so I've just been trying to figure out like, how can I help? Like, what are the things that I can provide um, to people that will help them? So I've been breaking down um, the stay at home orders, the executive orders, like trying to write them in plain English. Um, you know, just like I've been doing a lot of aggregate stuff, um, just trying to do, you know, what do I want to know as a citizen of Atlanta, you know, what can we look into? And so the other editors are kind of doing, you know, they're going out and pulling these stories and doing the stuff that's going into print. And, you know, for my part, I just, the thought that goes through my head every day is like, okay, we're a pretty small media market. What can I do to help? Like, what can I do to help my readers? What can I do to help out in the market? Um, and that's kind of just where my head's been at lately. And, well, and Meredith is being, um, she's being very modest because she is responsible for going viral with the hand washing to outcast all the stories and the memes about, what was it, which song was it? Um, it was Miss Jackson. Jackson. So you know how the little hand washing thing where it's a song lyric to the 20 seconds? So
So yeah. Mirrored and that, out. that actually, that's so funny. It feels like that was a million years ago. Um, that's my normal beat. That's what I usually <laughs> do is uh, silly kind of fun stuff. Um, but that story is, it's not our most popular story of all time, but it's, it's up there. It may be the second. It's certainly our most popular story of this year and the most popular story we've had in that's years. Um, yeah. And I got so much feedback on it. So yeah. And it's, it's, yeah. That's awesome. But y'all just had some layoffs too, right at Atlanta Magazine. I mean, that to me is one of the big themes. If you want to talk about, oh, the theme of Corona and journalism, it's that the advertising has been going away and it's going away even faster now. Um, you know, I don't know. I've, I've always, yeah, I'll say to anybody anywhere, I harp on it a lot. I think the future of hard local news is nonprofit if it has a future at all. So I don't know. I mean, I don't want to be right, but. That's I, 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 Jackie, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Robin, Robin's putting her future on, on the line there for that. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is, you know, who's, you know, how do you pay for it? This is mm -hmm. the, this is the $64,000 question. Um, the, for me, the barrier has been the business piece of it. I'm not that great at that. And I know that. And so I'm trying to figure out how do I, pile up enough money to start and do the business licenses and get an attorney and make sure that the board is all you know people who should be on it and file all the paperwork and 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 so i'm working with institute for nonprofit news and with what is it georgia center for nonprofits and they have a pro bono attorney group that's somehow linked with them and those people have been great resources but anybody who wants to do that, go to INN because they have a whole like walk you through it giant handbook of how to. Uh, the problem is the, the the putting together of it. It's it's really time intensive. People say if you do that, you are now in the nonprofit business. You're not in the news business anymore, and you can forget about doing stories and everything else. But you know you got to do what you got to do. I I don't know what else to do at this point you know because there's not right let's be frank there's not a whole lot of people hiring you know late career 50 something people who took a break for grad school you know <laughs> and have been working at the county pay they're just not going to be beat down my door to give me a job it's their loss i think so <laughs> <laughs> but no i mean this this community needs this very badly i think it will support it the the feedback has been really strong and it's just you know, how much can I get done in 12 hours in a day? Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I do work for nonprofits. Too. I mean, not, you know, I, I'm a reporter at some nonprofits and I kind of, you know, I, I see a little bit of that myself. And I mean, it's like, if we were any good at business, we'd be business people, but we're not, we're reporters. So, so we call the center for nonprofits. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just in closing, guys, first of all, thank you. Um, we got a couple minutes left. And so um, I want to just thank everybody for coming. But I also wanted to let you know some of the things that I found this week. And I can send this out because I think I know everybody pretty much on the call. Uh, we can email you. But we had, I looked up just, you know, some tips for journalists about, you know, um, anybody who's covering COVID-19 and kind of breaking down some of the barriers. You talked about courts being closed or not able to access records or those kind of things. Um, there's just like the Columbia Journalism Review had some really good tips. Um, a publication called Marketing Week had some great tips kind of on the lighter beat side. And also UGA did a great interview with the, let's see, it was Professor Glenn Novak He's a former director of media relations at the CDC, and now he is at the Grady College of Journalism at UGA, and they interviewed him, and he gave some great, great tips about sort of hanging in there during the pandemic and what reporters can do to, um, you know, especially if you've been taken off your regular beat um, and pulled away to just make everything pandemic related, kind of some of the tips and tricks, so we can send that along if any of y'all are interested in that. And um, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming and any, any other final comments or questions or thoughts? 
Uh, just no, th thank you guys for having me for sure. Exactly. This is good. Everybody put on your masks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let up. your hair grow long right <laughs> let your hair grow long don't get your eyebrows done yeah thank you uh, maggie and thank you eric and robin for being our panelists and thanks everybody for joining us we, we're doing this every wednesday it's a it's a casual thing just hopefully we can help each other like i said we started it as a way to just kind of have a small community of journalists be able to speak in a sp safe space and just you know share what they're going through. So feel free to join us the next few weeks. We've still got great content coming up and uh, we hope to see you on Zoom again. Thanks thank so much. You. Thank, thank you very much, much. Eric and thank Robin. You. Thank you. Nice have to meet you. Night. You guys take Bye. care. Take care. Bye.